Here's the idea. Instead of using cold to refrigerate our food, can we use an inert gas to displace all the oxygen around our food? You know, so say we have a box, we divide it in half and we put uh, a sandwich in either side. And on one side, it's just open up to the atmosphere and just just like normal, like you left your sandwich on your countertop. And then on the other side, we hook up a bottle of some kind of inert gas, CO2, nitrogen, xenon, helium, whatever it might be. And then we, uh, with sensors, with oxygen sensors, we monitor the levels of oxygen in both of these halves of the box, right? So, so the first sensor, you know, just open up to the atmosphere would have like pretty constant oxygen level. But the second one, you know, I, I imagine the box would be perfectly sealed. So the oxygen would rise up a little bit. And once it got over a threshold, we'd puff in some of that inert gas. And then that would drop the oxygen level down and we'd, we'd, we'd rinse and repeat. And then, you know, we can do this for a period of time and, and set up a camera and take some time-lapse shots and see what happens. And by the end of it, you know, we'll see how, I mean, I assume that it would at least prolong the life a little bit. Maybe it wouldn't, maybe it would. It's hard to say. So that's why it's an experiment. So that's the idea. When it comes to inert gas refrigeration, we have some things for thinking. First thing, the pesky thing, is that there's organisms called anaerobes. And however they may do it, they don't need oxygen to survive. I think fermentation is an example of this process, so yeast might be an anaerobe. I think uh, there's some anaerobes that produce methane and stuff. That's tricky. Uh, another thing is when I was considering how I wanted to set this up, I had the idea to use CO2. CO2 would be nice because you can uh, find food grade canisters really easy and all the equipment and everything to mess with CO2. Um, for one, there's paintball, but two, uh, there's brewing supplies. A lot of people use CO2 in conjunction with beer for pressurizing kegs and whatnot. But when you think about CO2, what comes to mind after a while at least is that soda is fizzy. So if we put our sandwich in CO2, would our sandwiches become fizzy? I'm not sure that I'm really into that. Although maybe fizzy jelly might be good on PB&J. I don't know. Anyways, with this question, there's some equations that we can look at to give us a ballpark estimate of how fizzy a sandwich might become. Uh, the equation is called Henry's Law, and what it says is that the concentration of CO2 in your water is equal to the partial pressure of the CO2 times Henry's constant. Which for CO2 in water, it's 0.032 moles per liter atmosphere. So for comparison, if we look at a soda, the concentration of CO2 in your soda is about 0.14 molar. So that's 0.14 moles per liter. And for a sandwich, that is for all the water on the sandwich. So if you have a super dry sandwich, you don't have to worry about this, but who wants that? Uh, the concentration of CO2 would be one atmosphere, that's the partial pressure, presumably, times Henry's constant for CO2. And that comes out to be 0.032 molar. So in comparison with soda, it's, you know, 
about a quarter as fizzy. So if you if you can deal with that, if you can deal with a quarter, qu the qu a quarter of the fizziness of soda in your sandwich, then CO two might be a good choice. I don't think I can put up with that personally. Okay, then the last thing is. If we go through all the trouble of making this box with an inert atmosphere, there's a bunch of other fun stuff that we can do. Um, mainly, things that we might otherwise be concerned with catching on fire won't catch on fire in this box. So doing exciting experiments with, I don't know, plasma? For example, in a microwave or lithium batteries or anything like that. We can do that in this box. Also, things won't rust or corrode inside the box. So that's kind of cool. Here's a little bonus material to kind of explain what the heck I was talking about with partial pressures and Henry's Law and all that. So. Partial pressure is basically how much pressure a particular type of molecule is contributing in your gas. So if you have a box that's at one atmosphere of pressure total, and you have two different types of gas in there, here I've drawn CO2 and O2, um, if they're in the same amount, then they both contribute a half atmosphere towards that total of one atmosphere. And so it could be in different proportions. You know, if you have way more CO2 than O2, then the partial pressure of CO2 is much higher. And similarly, if you have a box and it's full of nothing but one type of gas, so if it's just CO2 at one atmosphere, then the partial pressure of that CO2 would be one atmosphere. So that's how I arrived at one atmosphere in my Henry's Law equation. Henry's Law. Henry's Law is to describe how much, uh, how much of a gas is going to dissolve into whatever liquid that you have. So there's a bunch of different constants depending on the gas and the liquid and all that. And so, you know, imagine that you have this airtight box and you fill it up with a little bit of water and then you fill up the rest of it with CO2. Uh, what's going to happen is that those CO2 molecules are going to bounce around off of everything, the sides of the container and the surface of the water. But sometimes, when they hit the surface of the water, instead of bouncing off, they're going to bounce right into the water. They're going to cannonball into that water, and they'll dissolve in there. Um, similarly, sometimes you'll have molecules that have CO2 that have been dissolved in the water, and they will... Uh, break free. They'll be on uh, on track to break out of the surface. So there's a lot of different um, there's a lot of different constants because you know CO two maybe more easily dissolves into water than uh, say gaseous. Uh, fat or something, you know, like gaseous oil. You know, oil and, and water already don't mix, so even if you have a gas of it, not very much is going to mix. Even if you it's at high pressure, not very much of it's going to mix. But if you have water and gaseous salt, salt very readily mixes with water, so tons of that's going to gonna mix in. So it increases the probability that uh, it, for salt, it increases the probability that when it when one of the molecules hits the surface of the water, that it's actually gonna go in rather than bounce off. And then you can kind of see that when you have way more um, partial pressure, when you have the partial pressure up, then that means like more of the molecules are hitting the surface with greater force because uh, 
pressure is me a measurement of force. So if you have a greater partial pressure, that means that they're hitting the surface with more force, so they've got a greater likelihood of dissolving into the liquid. So here I've written the amount of CO2 in the water depends on how hard the CO2 is pressing on the water. That's basically Henry's law. But to be more accurate, what we, what we can say is the concentration of CO2 in the water depends on the partial pressure of CO2 above the water. So that's basically all of it. What do you think? Do you have any ideas for a rapid test to see if inert gas refrigeration is even remotely possible? Do you think this is worthwhile? Did you learn anything or do you have any questions? I want to know. Thanks for watching and have a wonderful life. And I'll catch you next time. Goodbye.